Historians have called the three-day Battle of Gettysburg the turning point of the American Civil War. With the Confederate loss at Gettysburg, the high water mark of the Confederacy was reached, and the Confederates' hopes for an independent country were dashed. The question that historians always seem to ponder is, how did an army flush with success and with momentum on their side lose this battle? Relying heavily on General E. Porter Alexander's fighting for the Confederacy, we will attempt to answer that question. As the field commander of the artillery during Pickett's charge, Alexander was able to give a unique perspective on the battle. It is generally acknowledged that Alexander's account is one of the finest ever produced. And now, nine reasons why the Confederates lost the Battle of Gettysburg. On June 22, 1863, during the Confederate Army's move north from Virginia to Pennsylvania, General Lee gave Cavalry Commander General Jeb Stuart orders for how to proceed. There is still debate today on what those exact orders were. The essence of the orders, however, seems to be that Jeb Stuart should guard the mountain passes into Pennsylvania with part of his force, and with the remainder screen the right flank of Ewell's Second Corps. Stuart, in an endeavor to capture supplies, apparently moved too far east, and allowed the Federal Army to get between him and the Confederate Army. This caused Stuart to ride farther north than planned, thus delaying his return to the Army until the evening of July 2nd. As a result, Lee was left without a significant part of his cavalry for the first two days of the battle. Alexander comments on the episode, I am sure that was a bad play on general principles. We should always have our whole army in easy reach and supporting distance of each other. Such a raid could cut no real figure on the grand result, and was taking chances for no good. Yet in my humble opinion it was a bad play to let our cavalry get out of touch and reach of our infantry. The first axiom of war is to mass one's strength. Then, and then only, can its fullest power be brought into play. I cannot say exactly what would have happened, but our force in hand at the opening would have been greater, and might have easily changed the whole result. We took unnecessary risk, which was bad war. With the loss of Stuart, Lee had lost the eyes and ears of his army. Alexander believed that if Stuart had been present at the opening of the battle, the result might have been different. On June 30th, 1863, a brigade from General Harry Heath's division was sent to the town of Gettysburg in search of a supply of shoes. Since it was thought General Meade and the Federal Army were 15 to 20 miles south, strong resistance was not anticipated. As the brigade approached Gettysburg, they noticed a strong cavalry force occupying the town. The Confederate force did not attempt to drive out the Federal cavalry. Heath returned early in the morning on July 1st with his whole division and Dorsey Penner's division in reserve. The strength of the two divisions was about 12,000 men. As they arrived at the outskirts of Gettysburg, they were met by General John Buford's Federal Cavalry Division, which consisted of about 3,000 men. These troops delayed Heath long enough until the 1st and 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac arrived. The combined Federal strength was about 23,000 men. Heath and Pender were severely outnumbered. First, Alexander states that the absence of Stuart's cavalry had a significant impact on the encounter. Had they been with us, General Lee would doubtless have been too well informed of the enemy's exact location to have permitted two divisions to blunder into an attack upon two corps and a division of cavalry. Since Stuart was not present to supply needed intelligence of Union positions and strength, caution should have been employed. Alexander continues, when Heath's division was authorized to go to Gettysburg to get shoes, I think it should surely have had a similar caution to that given to General Ewell on the afternoon of the first day's battle, when he was directed to occupy Cemetery Hill, but cautioned not to bring on a general engagement. We are not sure if Heath was cautioned, but Alexander explains the dangers of not being cautious. The principle involved in such cautions, which are very often given, is not to waste the fighting spirit and power of the army on side issues. It is simply that of saving and concentrating energy for the vital point at the critical time. Alexander comments on the damage done to Heath and Pender by this tactical error. 
Heath and Pender were getting a genteel whipping by the very superior force they had inadvertently pitched into. Alexander goes on to note that Heath's two leading brigades had been almost ruined, and his whole division as an effective force was greatly impaired for the rest of the battle. Even though the timely arrival of reinforcements saved the day for the Confederates, severe damage was done because of a side issue. Following the first day of battle, the Federal Army took up a strong defensive position on Cemetery Hill. General Lee now had to decide whether to continue the offensive on the next day or establish his own defensive position on Seminary Ridge and wait for Meade to attack. Alexander notes the Confederate position after the first day of battle was also strong, however not as strong as the Federals. He says this about their position. It was no bad one, and it could never have been successfully assaulted. The onus of attack was on Meade anyhow. Popular sentiment would have forced Meade to take the aggressive. Lee, however, did not believe he could take a defensive position. His battle reports reveal that he decided to attack because he believed his army was too far from its base to be supplied properly for an extended time. Alexander refutes this by pointing out the army was at Gettysburg for four days, and when stalled at the Potomac, it was able to forage for over a week. He thus concludes that Lee didn't need to attack. It does not seem improbable that we could have faced Meade safely on the second at Gettysburg without assaulting him in his wonderfully strong position. He concludes, I think it must be frankly admitted that there was no real difficulty whatever in our taking the defense of the next day, and our so maneuvering afterward as to have finally forced Meade to attack us. Finally, he adds what he thought Lee's decision cost the Confederates at Gettysburg. I think it a reasonable estimate to say that 60% of our chances for a great victory were lost by our continuing the aggressive. Alexander suggests that the decision by Lee not to take defensive action on the second day was the crisis of the battle and this campaign. Alexander did not think the Confederate position on Seminary Ridge was a bad one. However, he did think that Meade's was exceptionally strong. He said the federal position was a position unique among all the battlefields of the war, certainly adding 50% to his already superior force. Alexander notes that the federal army had a significant superiority in men and arms. It is estimated that the federal army had about 94,000 troops compared to 72,000 for the Confederates. The Federals not only had superiority in numbers of men, Alexander also commented on the superiority of the Federal artillery in quantity and quality. Additionally, Alexander estimates that because of the physical qualities of the Federal defensive position, their strength would virtually increase by up to another 50%. Observing some of the defensive positions of the Federals and realizing that they held the high ground, it is not difficult to understand Alexander's point. For I am impressed by the fact that the strength of the enemy's position seems to have cut no figure in the consideration of the question of the aggressive, nor does it seem to have been systematically examined or inquired into, nor does the night seem to be utilized in any preparation for the morning. Alexander suggests that the federal superior ground was not a consideration in the Confederates' battle plan for the second day. He even goes so far as to say that the position was not even scouted the night before. He continues, Not only was the selection about as bad as possible, there does not seem to have been any special thought given to the matter. The Confederates' second day attack, according to Alexander, was poorly planned, if planned at all, and greatly facilitated Meade's preparation for defense. He exclaims, Verily that night it was pie for Meade. Concerning Ewell's troops, Alexander relates that Lee had ordered the troops from their original position northeast of Gettysburg to a position to the right of town. The reasons for the move were that his position was far from the lines of retreat and not convenient for reinforcing others or being reinforced. Ewell subsequently petitioned Lee to occupy some nearby ground he thought he could take. Alexander is undoubtedly referring to Culp's Hill. Alexander's opinion was that from this ground the enemy's position was almost unassailable. 
Although Lee consented to the move, Yule could not take the position. Alexander notes, however, that orders were never given for Yule to move from his awkward position. He writes, There was no reasonable probability of his accomplishing any good on the enemy's line in front of and where his artillery was of no service. He stayed there till the last. The ground is there still for any military engineer to pronounce whether or not Yule's corps and all its artillery was not practically paralyzed and useless by its position during the last two days of the battle. Alexander relates that General Lee had wanted the second day attack to begin by 10 or 11 o'clock. However, the Confederate attack did not go as General Lee planned. Initially, General Longstreet asked Lee to postpone the attack until the arrival of the last brigade of John Bell Hood's division. General Lee Van Der Law's brigade finally arrived about 12 o'clock noon. Then, to avoid being seen by Union observers, the Confederate column was ordered to take a circular route to get into position. This caused another four-hour delay. Alexander, however, states this was unnecessary. He relates that he had previously found a route to the location that took only one hour instead of four. He states, Of course I told the officers at the head of the column of the route my artillery had followed, which was easily seen, but there was no one with authority to vary the orders. New orders did eventually arrive after a lengthy delay. Alexander continues, It has since appeared that if our corps had made its attack even three hours sooner than it did, our chances of success would have been immensely increased. There seems no doubt that had Longstreet's attack on the second been made materially sooner, we would have gained a decided victory. Alexander suggests the delay allowed the Federal Fifth Corps to occupy Little Round Top, maybe the most important strategic position for the whole Union line. It is generally acknowledged that General Longstreet placed Alexander in charge of the 1st Corps' artillery during Pickett's charge. Alexander states, My orders were as follows. First, to give the enemy the most effective cannonade possible, try and cripple him, to tear him limbless as it were, if possible. General Longstreet's expression, drive off the enemy or completely demoralize him. When the artillery had accomplished that, the infantry column of attack was to charge. Although Alexander was in control of the main bombardment, there were other artillery units available from other corps that were not in his control. This resulted in an uncoordinated artillery strategy. He writes, Each chief artillery officer of each corps was left to his own devices. This lack of coordination between artillery officers led to several problems. First, Alexander relates that overall, Artillery Commander General Pendleton had given him nine howitzer cannons that he planned to use as an aid to the artillery as they charged. However, when the charge commenced, some of the cannons were missing. Alexander states, After the battle, I found that General Pendleton had sent and taken four or five of the guns and disposed of them elsewhere without any knowledge to me. Later on, Alexander comments that these guns would have greatly aided the infantry charge. Second, Alexander notes that A.P. Hill had 65 guns in action on Seminary Ridge that were not properly used. He advanced no guns, either before, during, or after the charge that I ever heard of, though the left half of the column, Pickett, was in Hill's front. Alexander was also critical of a morning artillery duel Hill's artillery had with the Federals. It expended a good deal of ammunition, but gained the Confederates no advantage. Alexander reserved his greatest criticism of artillery leadership for Ewell's Corps. The battle line at Gettysburg has been classically described as being in the shape of a fishhook. The Federals maintained the interior position, while the Confederates were positioned on the exterior. Alexander relates that this position created several disadvantages for the Confederates, but did present one great advantage. The one advantage of our exterior position, that of enfilading parts of the enemy line, was not utilized. An enfilad fire is gunfire directed from a flanking position along the length of an enemy battle line. Alexander states that someone should have recognized the damage Ewell's artillery could have done. He added that no matter where Ewell's artillery hit, 
it would have done significant damage. But both the infantry and artillery lines which we were to attack could have been enfiladed from somewhere in our lines near Gettysburg. This is where the use of an artillery chief for the army comes in. He visits and views the entire field and should recognize and know how to use his opportunities. Alexander notes that a single corps commander could not possibly know what was going on in all parts of the field, so it was necessary for someone to be in overall command. He continues, Lee's chief should have known and given every possible energy to improve the rare and great chance to the very uttermost. Only one of Ewell's five fine battalions participated in our bombardment at all. That neglect was a serious one. Alexander does not say, but he may be referring to General Pendleton. Alexander suggests that a lack of an efficient central artillery command led to the loss of a rare and great chance for a successful charge. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary Hard times, hard times Come again no more Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. Oh, hard times come.